Good morning. Good morning, uh, Facebook Live. We're missing some folks this morning, so I'm going to start us off with prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Father, we are missing quite a few. We have been attacked by a virus, not the virus, but we've been attacked by a virus. And Father, we know that the enemy is always knocking at the door. The enemy is always looking for a way to creep in. He, he tries to subtract from the numbers. He tries to subtract from our confidence. He tries to manipulate and get into every crevice and every crack in our everyday life, Father. And Father, we pray for the boldness just to shine and come out through us, that we overthrow, uh, overflow with the Spirit, uh, with your Holy Spirit, Father, to be strong, to be strengthened, to stand in courage. Uh, to continue on the mission, to believe in you, to follow you, to be led by you, Father. So, Father, we pray for those that aren't with us this morning. We pray for healing. We pray for your touch over their household. Well, we pray that you just sustain them, provide for them, heal them, Father, get them healthy, Father. We pray that you just anoint that family, because that family, I do know, Father, is anointed, and that you love that family. So, Father, I pray that you that you just lift them up, that you uh, give them a spirit of courage to just push through, to press through, Father, and just be with them in that house where they are right now, Father, where they are watching this morning with live, Father, I pray that you are just with them in spirit, and that you are motivating them and curing them and helping them, Father. And for those of us that are in this room, Father, I pray that we feel your spirit move as we close out this series that you've laid on our heart. Father, as we continue the mission of focus and that we continue to take what you've been speaking to us and raising up in us so that we can believe and take steps of action to bring about change. Father God, you are amazing and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, we are small today. But we got folks on live right now watching. Uh, we do have lots of folks asking. And it's just, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I confessed this morning to, to Lauren when she got here that it's difficult sometimes to, 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 to deliver. I hate saying it like that, but to deliver when it's small. When you're, listen, we're in my living room, or we're in my, our front room right now. It's definitely different preaching the word in your home. But then, as I was having those seeds of doubt in me this morning, I thought about how awesome it really is. To think about preaching the word, that you know, the word that God's laid on my heart in my house, because then the overflow, like how, like you guys said this morning, having our kids in, even if they, we can only keep their attention for that small portion of time to see Lauren sing, and as we worship as their parents, you know what, the overflow of that will help them believe, you know, like hey, I watch my parents Amen. do this, and you know, wherever God does with focus or takes focus. I think of the seed that we planted in the little hearts and minds of our children that, you know, whatever God does with this, that heart, that, that seed will be in their mind that maybe one day it'll sprout in their minds when they're raising their families and they feel the call of God and they're doing things in their life. And so with wrapping up our, our series on, uh, on on being on mission and talking about where we are and where, and where we came from with the with the, the seeds of the planted on our hearts for our community, for each other, for uh, personal, individual growth, for community growth, for team growth. Um, we talked about living the life that we have been given, you know, the life that God has given us, where a lot of us minimize our culture and society minimizes the, the, the call on the, our lives. That It's so heartbreaking to hear a lot of folks say that, that there's no purpose to life. We just kind of wander around. But yet scripture tells us otherwise that there's a distinct purpose to each individual life and then corporately together that there is a call for all of us. And, and then the second part that we talked about was obedience. You know, you, you part of loving who you are, which I just skipped over to the next one, is being obedient to God's word that He said on you, that He said that you are chosen. He has selected you, He has predestined you, He has glorified you, He has called you. That's part of obedience. Obedience isn't just the rules that we think about all the time, even though rules do have their place because rules define a relationship. But if you live the life you're, you get, you're given and then you move in active obedience, then you start to, to love, which an act of obedience in love is the permission to love yourself because you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to our first core value, which is to live. So I mean, they all tie together. And if you can learn to love yourself, then you can love your neighbor. And if you can learn to love your neighbor, then you can surely, you can start turning a corner to love an enemy. Somebody that you, uh, which I heard, uh, again, I give the credit to Bob Goff, that, that placed that seed in my mind, mind that your enemy is any way that's different than you. It doesn't have to be somebody that, that you're outwardly grudging with or, 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 or fighting with it, but it's somebody that's different than you because 
uh, in today's culture, and even in, in, in Jesus' culture, uh, people didn't cross lines. If it wasn't part of your, your group, you didn't cross over that line. And Jesus went and talked to the woman uh, at the well. That was a big deal because he went and talked to a woman. A teacher wasn't supposed to talk to a woman. He didn't belong, in, uh, he didn't belong there. Uh, the way he spoke to Pharisees, the way he challenged the word, he, like he, he broke down those norms and those barriers. So when I think of the, the, the way Bob Goff flips that word, uh, your enemy is basically anybody that's different than you. Anything that that you normally, you know, that you don't have anything in common. That it may be a struggle, it may be a challenge to try and relate to that person because they're so radically different from you. But yet, Scripture tells us that all people are valuable and all people uh, are, are creatures of God. And, and so for, therefore we treat everybody as we would want to be treated ourselves. And so lastly, because I believe, we believe, that if you do one, two, and three, that you get to the fourth one, it's not that hard. Because in one, two, and three, to be able to do all those things, you'll see God show up. So when you get to our fourth pillar, which is believe, I believe that if you can live, you can obey, and you can love, believing really isn't a big deal. But ultimately, it is the biggest deal in our culture because everybody says, just don't believe. You know, I believe Jesus. So you, you, you go from Jesus was a real person, he was a historical person, but you know, I just think he was a great teacher. Or maybe he was uh, one of those uh, sages or something that just went up there and talked to him, good talk or whatnot. Some people like believe he was real, but they don't believe that he was God. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's people that don't even believe he's real. Like that, that this is just a whole bunch of made up stories of uh, to to get people to 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 believe in something or to follow some rules or to control people. I've heard that too. Like this is the book and Jesus. That was just an idea of a control. Um, and then you have those people that talk about, well, if, if your God is so great, then why are there similar stories uh, with all kinds of other uh, religions? And, you know, there's some similarities and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know what, that's actually a really good point. Because, you know, if there are a lot of similarities, that just gets my mind thinking that there really is only one God. Because there is a lot of similarities in a lot of what different people believe. And I believe that, that so there, to me... Uh, at least in seminary, led me to that, that idea that if there are a lot of these different similarities that cross over past, that just lets me to believe that there's one God. Just different people took it different ways because they manipulated God's word, which is what you see people do now. It's, it's, it's the same battles we've been fighting our, all our life. But, nonetheless, I believe if you can live, that you can obey, and you can love, believing honestly is not the big deal. But everybody seems to be stopped in that. They get stopped in their belief. I just don't believe. I don't believe what you believe. I don't know how you believe what you believe. I don't, and I think, well, how do we get here? Like as a team, and as we talked about 1 Corinthians 7, 17, and how Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church, and he's basically what he's, in that moment, going back and refreshing, is he is talking about, you miss it because you think he's talking about nothing but marriage, but in all reality, he's talking about all aspects of life. And, and, and to, to get to that core, that, that belief in Christ and that what he has done for you and what he has called for you to do, man, you just got to believe, you got to live, you got to obey, and you got to love. And I promise, like once you give your life to Christ, you can look back to the timeline of your life and you will see that he really was there. Mm -hmm. And then I do see how he did that. And I, so, I, man, I, sh I see how he mended that relationship for me. I, I moved in an act of obedience I didn't even know it. And then God worked through that, and he put a band-aid on that wound, or he sewed it up, or he provided this person to lead me through it. You start seeing those things in your life when you finally surrender to God, when you start finally living that life that you were called to live, and you obey, and then you start loving him. A lot of times, here's what we want to do. We want to get to the belief. And I think that's great. You have folks that, because it doesn't have to happen in any particular order, but I do believe that sometimes some people go into an experience of, uh, man, when I was in Charlotte, I got to go to um, Billy Graham's library. It was the coolest thing ever. Um, uh, for those that are intimidated to watch black and white things, you know, like, I, you know, we'll, we'll turn the channel because it's a black and white uh, uh, but a lot of his early stuff, his revivals were all in black and white, and like, oh, I can't watch that, it's too old. Man, I love the stuff he did in, in my generation, you know, like you watch him on TV. Like, I watched uh, one he did the other day, uh, I think it was in the early 90s, but man, the stuff he did when he was really young, man, 
the fire that, that he was speaking and just the boldness that he preached, which he did his whole life. Man, I, I do believe that there are people that come into contact and, 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 and that, 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 that just ignites that belief in their heart. But sometimes it's so much more than that. You know, because that, that, that belief has to go further than just Christmas Day, Easter Sunday, um, maybe you go Good Friday, maybe, you know, these different events. It's got to last more than that. It's got to be something that changes your heart radically. So I, I think in the, in the course of our life, we all are like Moses. We are disbelieved believers. At one point in our life, we disbelieved. At one point in our life, maybe you were raised in the church. I was raised in the church. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to be raised on two different sides. Uh, from my father's side, being raised in a Southern Baptist culture and, and church, uh, which was, uh, for all intents and purposes, even though I, I'm not going to go there because that'll hold, make a whole another fire. And on the other side, very strict, very in the Lutheran church, where I was raised Lutheran. I was, uh, uh, you dressed up every Sunday. We went three times a week. Uh, went through two years of catechism before I could receive Christ. Honestly, that's this is where I question God a lot. And I think that gave me the heart and the mind that I have for God. But um, nonetheless, I had those experiences. And I think they all started intermingling and helped me get to that point of belief. But I think that all of us, regardless of whether we were in the church, because even if you are in the church, we have a lot of unbelievers in the church that don't fully believe. that Because if you really did believe, everything that is in here, then there wouldn't be problems in the church because the church would be on fire. Mm -hmm. The church would be, I mean, loving everybody and our communities would be radically different. Church leaders wouldn't be falling. Worship leaders wouldn't be leaving. Um, there would be no doubt with the mission that we had. There would be no doubt with our networking and working together for the common good of all those that are out there because we love people the way that we love ourselves. And, uh, and truly, if we love people, the way we love ourselves, that we would truly know what love is. And I just think that even in the church, we get that wrong. And I, so I, I think that there's a battle of some disbelief. We believe some portions of it, but we don't believe all of it. Um, oh, there's this awesome song, and I don't know if we shared it. Um, I love Toby Mac because I love listening to his lyrics. And there's one song that, you know, that we rarely give God. Uh, we, we rarely give God all of us. We give God the broken parts, but we don't give him all of us. When, we, when you truly believe you give God everything, you give him your flaws, you give him your quirks, you give him the weird things about you, you give him the good things about you, and he takes it and he uses it all. But we all come from a point of disbelief. And so uh, we've all been there. We doubt ourselves. Just like Moses, remember, Moses doubted himself. He, and he doubted himself as a creature of God. And, and not to keep rehashing that out, but I think that is so important to to. To, to concentrate on is that the only time God got mad at Moses when he was in the, and the scripture is very clear that his anger burned was when he doubted himself, when he hated on himself, that he said that I'm not a good speaker, I'm not good enough, when he hated, like I think of how many times I've been hard on myself or thinking, God, I'm not good enough, God, I can't do that, God, I'm not equipped enough. I Man, I wonder if God got angry at me. Like, sat up there and said, oh, Listen, I, I have given you what you need to do. You just need to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are, and that, that, is, that is disbelief creeping in. That just like my prayer this morning, like, seriously, praying over Shelly and Willie and their family down on this virus is like, the enemy is always looking for ways to distract you, he's always looking for ways to beat you. Mm -hmm. um, my friend Gail at the, at the, um, um, chaplain train. Like, I love what she said. I shared it with the team this past week when we met. But the, the devil, Satan, will either wear you out of ministry, he will either run you out of ministry, or he will wear you out of ministry. Which one's he going to do? Because he's going to keep going as long as he can. He's either going to wear you down, or he's, and that doesn't matter if you are a ministry leader, it doesn't matter. It, Christianity, period. He will either wear you, he will either run you out of it, or he will wear you out of it. He will tire you out of it. And so you've got to protect yourself because he is always working against us. And when we let that those doubts creep into us, that's where it, it, that, it's like uh, uh, water getting into a crack and then it freezes and expands and just keeps it cracking. And the further the body gets, the harder it is to, to mend it, the harder it is to come back, the more costly it's going to be. I mean, think about that. The sin in your life, you let a little crack in, a little, little crack of deception, and then Satan gets in there 
and then it freezes overnight, expands a little bit, and then you know what? We've all been here. You get to that point like, well, I've already done it this far. I might as well just keep going with it. So then that crack gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when it comes to that point where you're in that realization where you come back to me, this is not how I was raised. This is not how I'm supposed to be. And then you look at the mess, which intimidates a lot of us from not going back into belief and living that life of obedience because then you look at all the things that you have to get rid of and the things that you have to correct, the relationships you have to mend. And you're like, man, that divide went from here to here. And man, that just looks impossible to to get back to where I need to be, and it keeps a lot of us from coming back. See, we look at a lot of what the world says that we're supposed to do. See, God is the one that's supposed to tell us who we are. But we allow the world's labels, we allow what the world says about us to continue to feed into us. Like, you're a loser, you're a gambler, you're an addict, you're uh, uh, uh you're weak, you're poor, you're, you're not equipped enough, you're not smart enough, you're, you're, you're a widow, orphan, kind of throwing those scripture things out to us. And so it comes to that idea, when you think about being a disbeliever or a believer, and I believe you go, you transition from one to the other, it ultimately comes back to who speaks louder into your life? Who do you allow to feed into your life? Who do you, like, what is the first thing you do in the morning? Um, we recently made a commitment that I will admit that I always have my quiet time, but I will admit that it's not always um, concentrated quiet time. Like, I think that I'm at that point in my life where I have that quiet time because I need that strength to go through. But then I think, how often am I, am I distracted that something else is on? How often am, am I reading my devotion or my scripture with the TV's on? And, and I've started to, to recognize that there are these things like, doing a good thing, and I'm focused on the good thing I'm doing, but yet I got a bad one, so there's a little bit that's watching the news, but I'm doing this, but this still counts. But is it really doing me any good? Is it setting me up for that day to, to protect me to continue my walk of life? And so I think that um, you think of so, you know, think of like, you know, focusing on Moses and how God's anger burned with him, and, and, and how frustrated he was. And, and to back up a little bit, and I think that's in uh, chapter 4. And so chapter 4, and in chapter 3, Moses, even doubting himself, had already seen a whole bunch of God's work in his life. Like, he'd already seen some burning bush, and he's talking to a bush as he's doubting God. And he's really like, I don't know about you, that's a, that's a pretty awe-inspiring <laughs> sign right there. But he's still having this argument with God, and not believing God, and he's arguing with God, and, and, and because here's what I think Moses was, and here's where many of us are that can't cross over into that belief. And this is like if you're absent of one, two, and three. If you're absent of living and obeying and loving, then you're just trying to get right to belief. And I think that part of Moses' problem is he was stuck on who he was, not who he was going meant to be. He's stuck on who he was. So he is not living the life that he's been called to live. He's, he's living in, in, in doubt. He's living in fear. He's living in hesitation. He's living in frustration. He's living in anger. He's living in hurt. He's living all these different things. I mean, he found out he's an orphan. He found out that he's not, he, you know, I'm not an Egyptian. Uh, then he was rejected. You know, all these different things in his life. And, and he ran away from everything that he knew. And so he's stuck in this position. And so he's stuck on who he was. And yet God is telling him who he's going to be. But he doesn't want to believe. He's afraid. And so who we become is more important than who we are. It doesn't matter who we are. All right? It doesn't matter the, the mess that we're in. It doesn't matter the struggles that we've been in. It's who we become is way more important than, than who we are. Many churches, many pastors say the best is yet to come. You're the, what happened yet? Yeah, your day today is going to be better than yesterday. And it all depends on the outlook you have on your everyday life. It depends on how you view life. It depends on um, do you let what happened yesterday rock your world? Because science says that if you dwell on things in your life, it will stay with you, and it will stay with you, and it will stay with you. You have to make conscious effort to cast all that out. If you have uh, pretensions, or, or if you have built in uh, in your mind and in your heart that you attach to things, like I'm a people pleaser, so I really attach to what people say. It's very hard, it, you know. And it, 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 you can let that make or break you, and that is a hard thing to break to be a people pleaser. Or I found out in chaplaincy, like just you call them, uh, Gail called Miss Gail called us all out. Like I'm a fixer. It's a struggle for me to listen because I want to fix it. Like I got a an anger. If you're talking about your problem, I gotta be able to, to, to shut up and listen because I can't just fix everything. 
and it's, and it's okay to add it. Honesty is the best thing. I really did. And I, and I learned that, like, and this is great. I'll take this into my marriage. That sometimes just being present is enough. Like, I don't have to fix it. I just, as long as I'm present and I can listen. You know, but you've got to be able to recognize these things because science tells us if we attach to some negative things, those negative things will stick with us. And so what I'm saying, what Scripture is saying, what God is saying to Moses is, listen, I know what you've done. I know who you are. I know where you've been. I don't care. Because I know where I want you to be. And I know where I'm taking you. And I know what I've built you for. I know what I created you for. And I, I know all these things that you've experienced, all these things that you've gone for. They, listen, Moses, they're just going to equip you for what I need you to do. But my, what I have in store for you is better than where you are right now. And I just need you to believe right now. And of course, Moses is here. And is, uh, it's not good enough, God. I, I, I can't do this. And, uh, and, and again, God is telling you, he's telling me. He says, listen, your experience, the gifts and the skills that I've built inside you, have equipped you for what I've got for you. Um, and, and, and your experiences, your events, your circumstances that you've experienced. I will tell you that the moment that God woke me up, the Eureka moment, and again, being a believer, I was raised in the church. I firmly believe uh, I was raised in the church. And God gave me this, 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 this questioning mind that was not very well accepted by my parents. I love my parents, but they did not accept that you're not supposed to talk to the pastor that way when your senior pastor of your church is telling you this is what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to talk to him like that. But I would ask him questions. Does this mean this? Does that mean that? Why would he say that? What was that? You know, I think it's pretty logical. Why would the, the man that should probably be able to tell me? And nothing against that man. He's a very awesome man. I've met him uh, again since I'm an adult. Uh, but it, it just, God gave me an inquisitive mind. But I will say that I don't believe that I truly embraced belief fully until I was an adult, until I finally woke back up again. And, and then, like I was telling you earlier, it's shaking off that, that rust and the dust and the chains and the stuff. Then I could finally look back of the, of the path of my life and I could see where God showed up in experiences and circumstances, even though never gave him credit, never gave him credit at those moments. I can still see, I can see it's clear as day. I can see where he was there. I can see where he showed up. I can see where he provided. I can see where as a 19-year-old kid and having a, having a child and dropping out of college, I can see where he provided me a job. It wasn't a good job. Didn't like that job. But man, did it teach me a lot of stuff? It taught me taking a kid that had never really done manual labor and put me into a manual. And man, it gave me such appreciation for the men and women that get into the ditches and dig stuff and fix things and, and keep our infrastructure running. Man, I had such an appreciation. It gave me health benefits that provided for my family that I needed at that time. Um, it gave me a few, gave me an end. You know what it did? It introduced me to police officers. Provided me an opportunity to, to really know policemen. And then and then I started this, this route of, I know I'm better than this. Nothing against what I was doing, but I knew I was meant for more. And so I was like, man, I'm going to try this out. I'm 20 years old now. And it took me almost two years to get hired on those police officers. Because everybody told me I was too young. So uh, by the time I was 21, I got hired. I'm like, I still see that as, and then God made me a police officer. It was great, right? And then my whole goal of being a police officer was getting here, get some experience, go federal, make more money, secure my future. But then I got into law enforcement, and it changed who I was. And then I'm like, I remember hitting that point, like, is this where I'm supposed to be? And not to go through all of that, but I can look back now and see, man, God provided me a job in that even one. God provided me a career at 21 years old that, though there are lots and lots of bumps and bruises and paths that I chose that were wrong, God still provided an opportunity there. Now, God brought the woman of my dreams into my life and that fixed a lot of things. Uh, then I look at the things, struggles of having babies, and then I'm like, man, did he, did he show up there? Like, that's the miracle of our life. Like, man, you can just go back and you can see the providence of God through all of those experiences. And that's what he's telling each and every one of us. That's what he's telling Moses is, listen, I have provided the evidence for you to believe in me. You are just blinded not to see it. You can't see it. You haven't seen it. You, guys, you don't see it. And so my prayer is that each of us have those experiences. And if you're a believer now, my prayer is that you're able to sometime in your quiet time look back at the provision of God because the evidence is there. The evidence is all around us. Um, i got to share that with you, Aaron. That's my favorite spoken word. I'll, I'll send that to you. Uh, Stephen Curtis, evidence. I mean, the evidence is everywhere. Scripture tells us the evidence is all around us. 
but but we constantly discount the evidence so about uh, something else as science. Well, we, I, I choose to believe differently, but it, it it doesn't happen overnight. Like for Moses, it didn't happen overnight. There was a lifetime of experiences for him to get where he was, and and and, to have, and still at that moment in the presence of God to still have the doubt and the frustration and the anger and the lack of belief in God and in himself to go and do what God had asked him to do. So if it can so take, take Moses a little bit, man, it's sure going to take us a little bit. And I want to share this. So, so as, there, as Moses is having this conversation, after he's had this conversation with God, God provides for him. God says, you know what? You're hating on yourself. You doubt yourself. I'm going to go ahead and give you what you asked for. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you Aaron. He's going to go with you. So Moses and Aaron brought together. So so he gives him Aaron, and then he tells him what he needs him to do. And so Moses does. He moves in an act of obedience. He he starts to embrace who he is. He moves in an act of obedience, and he goes to the people that he's called to love. And Moses and Aaron brought together all of the elders of Israel, of the Israelites. And Aaron told them everything the Lord had said. Because remember, Moses is afraid to speak, so Aaron speaks for him. Uh, and he also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. So Aaron spoke, Moses performed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. And continuing on afterwards, Moses, so, so first he went and approached Israel. Great, right? Let me tell you that how intimidating. So first Moses is scared already to speak. But now he's called to go speak to a people who have been in bondage for 430 years. God has been silent. I think we minimize that. That God had not been talking to them. They had not been, and they're in misery. They're, and, and Moses, who really is one of them, but not one of them. Because remember, when he killed the Egyptian, they were like, who are you to tell us who you are, who, what to do? They didn't believe. They're like, get out of here. So he flees, and he goes to his father, and he, you know, he runs out to the desert, and he meets his, his spouse and lives with his father-in-law. But they didn't greatly receive him, and now he's called to go back and talk to them and tell them that, hey, this is what God said. So that took some boldness and courage and act of obedience. One, the acceptance of his calling on his life, the fact to be obedient, and to go back to a people that have rejected him already and go back and talk to them. And say, this is what God, and, and because he did those things, he accepted and he went and he did, they began to worship God. They realized that God was listening to them. God was not absent from their life. God was still there. And so they went and worshiped. And here's the second phase of his, of his calling, is afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, wait a minute, who's this God? Because here's a man that doesn't even know who God is. Uh, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. And then they said, The God. So not like you could have probably stopped there. This isn't going to work, God. Like this is too hard, God. Like I can't do this. But Moses is obedient. And he believes in God. And he is, he is moving in, in obedience and belief. And he's moving in faith. And he continues. And he said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. So he is like he... I, we, let's concentrate again. He went to Israel. And he spoke to a people that rejected him about their faith in God and their belief in God. And notice, listen, God is with you. God is with us. He has seen your plight. He has seen your struggles. He is not absence of, uh, of what you have experienced. He will provide. And so he speaks to that people that are rejected him. They receive him. They worship God. And now he's called to go to a man that believes he's a God. I think that uh, what you will learn if you, when you study ancient cultures is monotheism is very different. Like believing in one God was not something common back then. There was a God for everything. There was a God of the harvest. There was a God of the rain. There was a God, you know, there was, they had gods for everything, let alone facing Pharaoh, who believed he was a God. And he, and he had to approach Pharaoh and tell him all that and say, let my people go, let my people go and worship. And you saw Pharaoh's response. He was this God. I don't know your God. Who's your God? I'm not going to let you go. And then it doesn't stop there. And he continues to tell them, if you wait, you don't. You're going to have problems. And so I think that what keeps a lot of people from believing is we think believing is easy. 
Like we think that, so maybe you're thinking like the focus that the pillars are backwards. Maybe belief should be first. Because belief, you know, you know, is the hardest thing to get. But I can live my life. Well, no, you're, you're living the life, but you're not living the life you're called to live. You know, maybe uh, you can question the ideas of obedience. There are, there are certain things in life I obey. I don't kill, I don't murder. But listen, God said, but listen, if you think about it, you did. You know, we're all full of sin. We all are born in sin. We are all sinful creatures. Um, and then love. And why do I love? I love people. You love on your own condition. You don't love the way that God has told you to love because you love the conditions. See, you think of believing, the misconception of belief is that you think it's easy. That it, that it's easy. I bet none of that was easy for Moses. Moses had already, let's call it what it is, talked back to God and said, listen, I'm not good enough. I'm not equipped enough. I can't do that. He talked back to God. Do you think that, I can imagine him shaking as he's talking to Pharaoh. Maybe not as he's talking, but maybe as he's approaching. Because I think for him to get to the point where he spoke, he had to have that boldness and that courage and belief to be able to do that. Because it took a boldness to do that. It wasn't easy what God had called him to do. And so, I want to show you how God works. He's absolutely amazing. I, I was reading, I'm reading uh, David Jeremiah's full. Love that. It, it's been a very awesome book. I'm late to the party reading. I've been asked to read it several times and finally got it. Um, and there's a section that he talks about uh, uh, Earl McKinnis, uh, the big man, sorry, wrote a book called Seizing Your Divine Moment. And I think what this, this little quote capitulates, like it really captures um, the idea that faith is not easy. Believing is not easy. And, and what uh, what he says is, I want to reiterate the fact that the center of God's will is not a safe place. And I said, oh, the center of God's will is not a safe place. What do you mean? Like, I thought that I could go to God with anything. It should be like a comfort zone. It should be a safe zone. I love this. What I want to reiterate, the fact that the center of God's will is not a safe place, but the most dangerous place in the world. I said, oh, man, wow. That's pretty big. Like, and this is how I read. Like, I really just stop. Like, really, I'll stop at a sentence and just let it sink in. And he continues, he says, God fears nothing and no one. God moves with intentionality and power. To live outside God's will puts us in danger, but to live in his will makes us dangerous. And I'm like, wow! It's like, that just gives me chills reading. And I know it sounds like a tongue tire, but let's break it down. And you want to reiterate the fact that the center of God's will is not a safe place. Why is it not a safe place? Because he may go ask you to go talk to Pharaoh. You know what I mean? He may ask you in that moment, in your work environment, where they're challenging you to renounce God and say, God is not the, the, your God. But he's asking you to stand up for your faith and what you believe. He's asking you to be obedient to what he's called you to do. Maybe for you, it may be the, the idea of uh, loving a spouse that did you wrong. Maybe a child that did something that, that did something egregious. Or maybe, uh, like I use that example, uh, for love uh, of, of Pope John Paul when he went and looked at the, the man that tried to assassinate him and had, and had confession and prayer with him. Like, that's a big deal. You know, living in God's will is dangerous because it's going to make you do things that normal people don't do. Normal people as in the rest of the world. Um, starting a, a, a church is not what normal people do because it's not safe. Running out and doing your own business is not safe. Doing things the way God has asked you to do. Being patient in God's will and, and moving through your, your corporate environment the way that God has raised you up and, and the core values that he's given you to do it his way and not the world's way is, is dangerous. Because the enemy will use all those things like in the corporate world as, as, as people are excelling because they do certain things specific ways or they stab people in the back or they do a deceit or they cheat or cut off the top. You know, but you choose to do it the honest and the faithful way, just to live out the purpose that God has given you, and in the moment, and, and just trust God that He's going to provide. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And so I love, like, I put it in bold here on my tablet that God moves with intentionality and power. There is nothing about the Christian lifestyle that is supposed to be timid and weak. And man, Jesus was bold. Jesus walked into a house of worship twice. We only say once, but He went in twice and, and threw everybody out. Because they were, they were just desecrating God's temple. He's the one that looked at the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and said, you're wrong. 
He's the one that, that went to people that know that people cast aside and would not talk to. He's the one that chose the least and made them the most. Like Moses was nobody. Moses was cast out. Like there was a chance that Israel may not follow a dude that was raised up in, the, in Pharaoh's household. I mean, here's a guy, uh, I forget who I heard preaching this sermon. Actually, I think it was Billy Graham said that, like, to think that Moses went back and approached in Israel, like there was a chance they would not believe him because he was not one of them. Yes, culturally he was, but he was raised in Pharaoh's household. And on the flip side, Moses could have been like, listen, he was next to me. There's a possibility he could have been Pharaoh one day. But he chose Moses for a calling and a purpose and, and put him through experiences and walked him through those experiences and provided for him so that he could get him where he wanted. Living in God's will is dangerous. Living in faith is dangerous. Not dangerous as you're going to fall off a cliff, but dangerous that it is radically different than what the world has called us to live. It is so radically different. It, that, and I love how the, the Erwin kind of wraps it up, that God's will puts us in danger. But to, you know, uh, sorry, sorry. So to live outside God's will puts us in danger, but to live in it makes us dangerous. I think we are dangerous. We are dangerous because we don't respond the way the world responds. We are not, as you see through Scripture, we, Moses fails and falls, so will we. But we continually come back to being led by God. To, to, to lead, you have to be led. And, and I think that to, to get Moses where he was and to get him to keep moving, he was led by God. And so I think about some of the things in life, like to be led by God. You know, if you're, if you're led by God, you're led by God when you believe. See, when you are faithful and when you believe, that's when your life is being led by God. That's when you tr truly turn the spirit all over to him. It's like, what is this a uh, Carrie Underwood song? Uh, Jesus, take a wheel. Jesus, take a wheel. Let, let him drop. Like, let, you know, it's, it's true, but honestly, I think I've spoken on it before that control is the, is the, is the, is a complete uh, myth in our life. Like, we think we are controlling everything. And control is uh, it's a mindset. Like you think that you can control everything, but ultimately surrender is where it's at. When you surrender to God, when you circle back to God, say, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what you want to do, but I'm ready. I'm listening, and just Father, just provide. And again, have that wake up moment in your life. You can look back and see those moments where you did surrender. You see God show up. You see the provision He provided. You see the things, and so. What gets you to that point of belief? Like Moses, what made Moses bold enough to go back and talk to Israel? What made him bold enough to go face Pharaoh and then ultimately go, go back and face Pharaoh multiple times? As I think it's the relationship. See, relationships are only as strong as the belief that we have in the people or the person, right? And hear me on that. A parental relationship is only as good as the belief that my children have in me. If they believe that I have their safety in my heart. They may not like it, but there's a moment where they believe, they, they believe that what mom and dad say is good. Same thing with siblings. Like, man, I got to see my siblings, and I haven't seen my siblings in pushing two years. Oh my goodness, this guy, I do not like coronavirus. Um, and have all my siblings and my nieces and nephews around yesterday. And just like we have such a great relationship because there's a belief in one another. Like we, we love each other. You know, they're my siblings. How about your spouses? Like, you know, I'm sure my wife can look at me and tell me something and it's more weighty than what maybe uh, Laura may tell me. And I'm sure the same thing for you too because there's a belief in her that her best interest is at heart. Even though it may sting, I may not like it, she may tell me I'm a jerk, go have a cup of coffee, or look at me and say, listen, leave the kids alone right now, you're upset about something that makes no sense. You know, but... It's more weighty because there's a there's a relationship there, and that relationship is based off my belief in that person. You know, I believe that Moses was able to take these steps and these actions and continue to 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 resist the enemy and the ploys of the enemy and the destruction of the enemy and the frustrations of the people. Because we'll get to that, people aren't easy because he had a relationship with God and he believed in God that no matter what happened, no matter what came, that it was all going to be okay. That God had it in store for him. See, Moses, in Moses' belief, that his belief gave him strength to move forward and to keep pushing forward. And you see that. The 
the Lord, uh, so in Exodus 30, the Lord would speak to them. This is how their relationship developed. And I love this. We don't ever spend a lot of time in church really talking about this. But the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. Face to face. As a man speaks with his friend. Face to face as a man speaks with his friend. That's a relationship. That right there is defining a real, as a friend. Face to face. They would meet in the, in the, the, the tent of meetings, right? The only person that could go in and speak to God face to face was Moses. And he went in. And Aaron would stand outside. Aaron was not allowed inside. He'd guard like the entrance. He'd stand outside. And he talked to, talked to God as a friend. And I mean, that to me is amazing. That is, a, that is a clear definition of the relationship that Moses had with God. A friend. And he listened to God. And they had those conversations. And they spoke with him. And the way that we speak matters. The way that we speak in these relationships matters. The way that I speak to Carrie matters. The way that I speak to my kids matters. The way that I speak with God matters. The way that I respond matters. If you think of the the relationships you have in your life, the way that we speak in these relationships, your friends, your family, your supervisor, a a co-worker, a stranger, all of those things, it, it all matters. In each of these relationships, our communication may differ, right? The way I speak to my wife will be different from the way I speak to Aaron, or the, uh, the way that I speak to my wife will be different than the way I speak to Amber. Uh, the way I speak to my kids will be different than the way I would speak to Vice, because they're my children. I'll speak to my kids differently than I would speak to Vice. Um, our, our communication differs. But if you can get back to what God, the relationship we're supposed to have with God, you know, and get comfortable with the way we're supposed to communicate with God, to just, what does Scripture tell us? Scripture tells us that we can ask God for anything. Ask Him for anything. You know, when we come together, we, when we're in community, we come together. We're in Matthew 7, Mark 11, go to God with anything and ask Him. But many of the times, we're not willing to ask God. We're not willing to bring uh, those moments of intimacy, those, those flaws to Him. God, help me find a way out of this. God, this relationship is not good for me. God, this relationship is too tempting for me. Help me. We're embarrassed. We're ashamed. Yet he already knows. He knows what you thought. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. He knows what's in your eyes. He knows what you touched. He knows what you did. But we're still afraid to come to him because you think you could hide. There's a something. Uh, there's a there's a something in that moment of surrender that keeps us from believing. Like you know, you, because you're, you don't want to give up that part because you think that he what he asks for it all, and in, in 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 return he'll give it all to you. And so Moses makes that moment of surrender. And I think because uh, what I love about this and, and, and how Moses has this relationship with God, it, it is extremely powerful, extremely awesome, and it gives him the, the confidence to do exactly that, to go to God with anything. To go, he believed enough. He believed in the relationship enough that he could go to God. So he had a tough conversation with Israel. He had a tough conversation with Pharaoh. And man, look at this conversation that he has with God. This is Moses' question. God. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way, so I may know you, you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And I guess God really needs really to remember that, right? That this is your people. The Lord replied, this is how God responded to him. I mean, that's pretty assertive. You have been telling me. Uh, you have said. I mean, he's calling God on the carpet. These are the things you have promised me. This is what you said to me. And here's what God says. You think, let's rewind. You think that God would be frustrated with that tone of voice. But he was never frustrated with the questions. He was frustrated with Moses when he questioned himself. Isn't that awesome? Like, he was mad at Moses when he doubted himself. He wasn't mad at Moses when he asked him a question. So whatever's on your heart, and you're frustrated with God because of the lack of provision and the lack of understanding, man, bring it to him. Bring me anything, is what he says. And here's how he responds to him. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, I mean, now he's questioning him again, even though God gave him an affirmative answer. Do not send us up from here, and do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. And then Moses said, 
now show me your glory. So, man, that is a conversation between two friends where he is, I don't think Moses held back. Moses took his gloves off. Moses was going at it. And then when he, even God responds in some affirmative, affirming responses, he continues to do that. But then, like, Moses wraps it up by saying, well, now show me your glory. Show me your glory. What will you do? Show me your glory. What his glory is, he saves them. His glory is that he leads them, night and day. His glory is that he meets with them consistently. His glory is he gives them the commandments to live by. His glory is that, you know, even in the midst, and, and I want you to hold on to show me your glory. Do you know it is okay to look to God and say, show me your glory? Because when you move into belief, his glory is all around you. You'll see it in the littlest things. You'll see it in a little picture that a little boy drew the other day of a church. Daddy, this is our church. Like he drove a church. Like, I'm like, that's glory. That's amazing. God will show up. You just got to ask him, show me your glory. And I, I think that's so awesome when you think of that. That Moses did not hesitate to confront God. Moses did not hesitate to ask God. Moses did not, I mean, he was intentional with his words with God. It's because there was a relationship. And there was a belief. There is finally, in my opinion, when you read through Scripture, there is finally an acceptance of who he is. Moses has accepted who he is and is calling on his life. He's moved into obedience. God, you have told me to do X, Y, and Z. I'm waiting for you to tell me what's going on. I'm waiting for you to show me. So he's already he's been obedient. And his relationship is based off love. He loved the people that doubted him, but loved the people that drove. I mean, you read uh, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The people of Israel drove Moses absolutely crazy, but he loved them. He loved them without expectation, without uh, any uh, constraints, without any uh, returns, you know, because they, they provided hardship. Heck, they got him evicted from the promised land because he got frustrated with them. You know, I believe that what got him, uh, because he didn't listen to God, he got frustrated and he smacked that rock. You know, when God just told him to speak to it. You know, we got to get to that point in our life. And so I want to, as we're coming down to close, and I really, this doesn't make sense now, but I'll show you the scripture that comes into a past spot. See, I think that, like Moses, as life passes us by, Going back to that idea, when you look back through your life and you can see God showing up and you see his provision, you see his acceptance, you see his healing, you see his um, uh, opportunities that he's provided you, you see life passing by. And as life passes us by, we, we learn, we experience, we witness, we assess things differently. So like the way I look at things now is a lot different than the way I looked at them when I was 20. The way I looked at them when I was 20 was a lot different than I looked at them when I was 10. You know, the way I would look at life probably when I'm 60 will be a lot different than I look at it now. You know, it's amazing as you get through life and things that were important aren't so important at that point in your life. And, man, and I will remember. One of the best things about passing by is you remember. What you remember, you remember. And I think, honestly, you remember, just hold on to this, I think you remember more when you get older. Because, especially when you surrender completely and you move into belief, because when you get there, you can see everything he's done back there. Which only makes you stronger up here, because you're like, wow, he got me here. Even when I wasn't doing what he wanted me to do, he still provided. And, and I believe, moving into ministry, God provided me law enforcement. And I think that even though I wasn't living the way he wanted me to live, that was his idea, because this would be useful here. Like, and you see that constantly with God. But here's the problem. Again, going back to what Moses had done, is we focus on what we want to see, not what he wants us to see. We focus on where we are, not where we're going. And, and everything changes when you accept it and look at it through God's eyes. See, when you can, when things pass by, when you let life pass by, I'm going to get to that, because again, God met with Moses face to face, uh, but you'll you'll see here later um, what this what I mean by this. When you I'm, I'm going to share it. Don't you hold it back anymore. As the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness. So this is God continuing. Uh, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will pro proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. So this is God answering Moses from the previous verses. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will, whom I will have compassion. But He said. You cannot see me face, see my face. So they met. Basically, they met. But he wasn't like God is actually going to meet him. 
And this is powerful. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft, and in the rock, and cover you with my hand. I will cover you with my hand. That's intimacy. That's being intimate. Like, I will take care of you. Until I have passed by, then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face not, must not be seen. And when I think of when he removes his hand, and I will see my back, as you see God pass by, you see God's glory. And when he passes by, you see all the glory and the things that he's in, the provision and the guidance and the, and, the, and the things he's done in your life. And you see that God has passed by everything that he has done. It's like that awakening that you can see. And when you can see, you can identify. When you can see, you can assess. When you see, you can recall. See, God, you see, see, when you identify, when you see God's presence in your life, when you see it pass by you, when you feel it pass by you, that you know that something amazing just happened. And you identify differently. You feel differently about yourself. You feel differently about your circumstances. You could be the pit of hell right now. But when God passes by, you feel a lot different. I will never forget the day in the midst of trying to have a baby with multiple failures and multiple hardships, hardships on our relationship, hardships on, on my faith, like, wow, to even say that, to, to a woman that really was new to the church, new to the church thing, to, to, to a man who's very private, to go to some elders and say, will you pray over us and, and, and over the circumstance? And not even telling me, not even coming to me, but to, to telling me that morning over coffee, oh, by the way, after church, uh, uh, they're going to pray over us. What did you tell them? You know, and I remember the moment where we sat there, and Wes and Mike and, and Mark and, and other folks were around us, and they placed their hands on her, on me, on Connor, and praying. When you feel the presence of God, like I identify with it. Like that whole circumstance changed. Like in the midst of that, that crisis, uh, the cancer scare that was wrapped up in that mess, like it all changed clearly because I identified. Like, God is not absence of this. God is in this. Now I just got to believe it. Now I got to believe it. <clears throat> you assess things. I can look back on that experience now, and we, I assess it differently. Now what was a great wound, now what was a great divide, is now an amazing instrument. It is an amazing tool. It is a tool in the toolbox where I can go out to a hurting community and speak to somebody that is experiencing the same things. Or listen to them. And even though God may not provide to them the way that, I, that he provided for us, I can, we can still talk, we can still heal. And let alone God has already pulled that tool out of my toolbox. And I know you guys have heard this, but in seminary, uh, being uh, an evangelistic project, had to go out and met with a neighbor that I'd lived across from me for years and never knew that they were battling that very issue at that very moment. I would love to them right there. And so every time you see little Jackson come out of that tour, I want you to think of a miracle, that God's provision is always there. Now, your miracle may not be my miracle, but that's my miracle, so don't give up. So you assess things differently when you, when you, uh, when you look back. Uh, you recall things differently. So now I can look on that wound as a great remembrance. Like that was a great turning point in the relationship of our family, in our relationship with our God, that I could believe in. Man, it's just, I already believe, but when he, does, when he passes by you and does amazing things, it does something to you. It truly is an awakening. It truly is a revival. It truly is a fire that lights up your heart that you have to. And, and that fire, you've got to continue to, to, to ignite and keep it going because it will die. It will die. You know, uh, life gets to you. Life wears you down. You've got to keep igniting the fire. I mean, that is the call of focus to keep the fire going. I'm tired of looking at people sitting there not changing and not believing. And belief is action. Belief is doing. Belief is, is going out there and living and obeying and loving. And those are all adjectives. They are all active or not adjectives. They're all verbs. Like you've got to go out and do it. You've got to live. You've got to obey. You've got to love and believe. They're verbs. They're action words. They're things you've got to do. Um, when he passes by you, when he touches you, I mean, this is specific to Moses, but this is us every day. Every day, he puts his hand over us and protects us. Every day, he touches us. Every day, there is something in our life that, I, I oh, man, um, Gail said, I'm, I am going off tangent, but, man, I just, uh, we were talking about the difficulties of dealing with suicide, like how to speak to somebody about suicide. 
And when that all crazy question is asked, that is not the most helpful thing to be asked, is what do you want to have? Oh man. And I remember the response of some of my peers in that class was, um, I think it might have been, yeah, it might have been Narnia who sat up and said that listen, the best thing you can do for somebody at that moment is assure them whether they're a believer or not, that we are all God's children. And God, Jesus, left the 99 to go after the one. And when that person was in crisis, that was the one. And they had the utmost attention. I mean, that's how he cares for us. When you can get that belief and know that, that you are the one, if, 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 if today is my day to be the one, like he will step away from everybody else to look right at you and focus on you and be there and put his hand on you, put his hand over you. And I hope that in that moment he passes by you so you get to feel him, you get to see him. I mean, it's just amazing when you think of the things that God will do in your life. And with Moses right here, look what happens. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets, so up there he also gets the tablets of the Ten Commandments, of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. Aaron and all of the Israelites saw Moses. His face was radiant. When you have a presence, when you have contact with God, when God touches your life, when he affects you, it flows out of you. And, and though you may not have to be like Moses and put a veil over you, but I promise you when you have that moment and you have that experience, it will, it will overflow out of you. When you go through that revival, when you have that experience, people will notice. People will ask, how did you do it? How did you get through it? How, let me tell you how I did it. Let, and maybe not even tell them, but let it flow out of you. People will see the difference. People will see the change. People will want the change. There are people in our community that are looking for change. There are people that are sitting in churches looking for revival. There are people that are looking to be led. There are people that are looking to be loved. There are looking for people that are looking for purpose in their life. And the church is the call to, to answer. We're the ones that are called to pick up that phone and answer that call. We are called to go out there and make that change. We are. It's When you believe, it radiates out. You can't help it. If you truly have a belief in God, it should radiate out of every pore of your body. It should be in everything that you do. It should be in your work life. It should be in your prayer. And I'm not saying God is perfect, but I'm saying it should radiate out of everything you do. And if you know you have a tendency to, uh, man, I learned about Billy Graham um, just talking about how serious he was about the call of life. And it's brought some things on our table to talk about. But he was so serious about the call in his life and, that, and, the, and the temptation of the enemy to attack that when he would go away, and you think about a man that traveled all the time. Like he says, the greatest, that he credits to the raising of his children, his five children who were all, at, who were all working in strength, he credits their raising to their mother because I was always gone. Their faithful mother taught them God. Like here's the greatest evangelist ever to walk this, you know, besides Jesus and Paul. Like, he says, my wife raised them. My wife made my children God. You know, and I'm like, wow, that's incredible. But when he would go away and stay in his hotel rooms, he removed the TVs. Before he went into the hotel rooms, he removed the TV. No one's TV in it because it was a temptation. And he didn't want to get out. I'm like, that's pretty serious. Like, I can leave the veg out every now and then, watch a game, remove the TV because he was away from home. Not that he didn't watch TV, but because he was not home. And in a, in, a, in a safe and setting, he removed the TV. Before he walked into the room. I'm like, that's that is a commitment to being obedient. That is a commitment to a purpose. That is a commitment. And what I'm saying with that, if you know there's a weakness in your life, like if I can't have just one drink and I know that I gotta have more drinks, then maybe I should I gotta take a step. Or if I can't have that computer without specific things locked off of it, then I'm, I should I I need to cut it out of my life. It's taking those bold steps to be able to radiate the the, 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 the presence of God, to do those steps. Um, Moses, Moses displayed that. Moses did that. And Moses gives us hope because he still didn't do it all right. He still didn't get to go to the promised land. He still got frustrated because Moses is one of the greatest people to follow because he dealt with people. He dealt with people that were crying. He dealt with people that were belly aching. He dealt with people that were angry, frustrated, blamed him. I mean, he no sooner brings the Ten Commandments down that they end up building a, 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 a false idol. Prevail. 
and doing crazy things like that, even though they had a presence of God. He got to watch God every day. It's difficult. It's hard. But that's what we believe. That, that is, that is, that is the, the foundation of our belief, is to, is to live out that purpose, that call in our life. If you guys would close your eyes with me, guys online, you know, close your eyes. Um, this, guys, this is a call to change. This is a call to a mission. This is the mission of God. This is what he wants for you, wants for us, wants for our communities, wants for our nation, wants for our world. See, you are called to do, not just called to listen, not just called to, to, to be fed, not just be called to, to embrace for yourself. You're called to share. You're called to live. You're called to obey. You're called to love. Uh, guys, if you can to embrace those things, that purpose for your life, that that obedience to take those steps forward and, and, and to love like there's no tomorrow. Listen, God is there. God will show up. It doesn't, it does not matter to us, but do what he has called you to do. I'm not saying this as a call to, 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 to listen, I want you to be part of this church. I want you, uh, I want to start something great. I want to do something big for the Lord. But listen, if your call is to do something different that God has laid on your heart to go back to living out your purpose, then do it. There is no time to waste. There are some that believe that right around the corner, Jesus is coming back. But there's lots of people out there that are without God still. There are lots of people out there that still need change. There are a lot of people out there that just need you to reach out so that they know that they are loved and that there is a purpose for their life. Mm-hmm. See, I do want people to, I, I, listen, if, 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 if the call to focus ministry is on your heart right now, then I am asking, do you want to join us? Do you want to be part of this? Do you want to go out to a community and, and, and teach people what it is to live, to truly live a life that is worthy of God and a calling? To move into obedience. To get rid of that, that whole mindset that obedience is a bad word. And obedience is a good thing. Obedience defines a relationship. The obedience uh, gives, uh, gives stability to a relationship. Obedience gives us confidence in a relationship. Because obedience is, is built on relationship. And that relationship is built on a belief in a person. In God. In a spouse. In a friend. In a community. In a church. I mean, our communities no longer turn to the church for help. But the church should be a place for help. The church should be the first place the community turns to for guidance, for assistance, for help. God has changed that. I want a healthy kingdom. I want to raise up a healthy church, healthy people, healthy individuals that not only are healthy in self, but healthy in their family, that are, that are pursuing a healthy community through networking, through talking, through sharing, through loving, through helping, through assisting. And so, summing it all up, I mean, live that life that you're worthy of. You are worthy of this love. Your life is not wasted. Your life is not over. Your life is not defined what you were. Your life is going to be defined by who you will become. Live the life that you've been given. Embrace it. Own it. Embrace the experiences, embrace the wrongs, embrace the faults, embrace the learning curve, because it's the life you've been given. Obey his word, his call on your life, and to love like there's no tomorrow, and believe that all three of those things are sustained through him who believes in you. Because not only do we believe in him, he believes in us. And even when us, like Moses, doubt ourselves, he still believes in us. And he still provides a way. Ask God right now, show me your glory. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Father, we come to you at the foot of the cross. Father, we are asking you right now, show us your glory. Show us your glory in our everyday life. Show us your glory in our personal experiences. Show us your glory in our families. Father, show us your glory in our our professions. Show us your glory in our communities. Father, let us be hands and feet in that work and getting into the community. Father, help us, sustain us, enable us, provide for us, push us, guide us. Father, get us out of that mindset of lukewarmness. And Father, make us hot for you. Make us on fire for you. Provide us opportunities to stay hungry for you. 
Father, help us cast away the enemy. Help us to stop running from you and start running towards you. Father, strengthen us so that we're not worn out by the enemy. That we can continue to follow in obedience. To stay on that narrow path. And even though it's bumpy and it's rocky and there's hills and there's mountains, Father, that if we can stay on that narrow path towards righteousness, you will continue to provide for us. You will continue to be the way. You will continue to speak to us and through us and for us and provide for us. Father, we have put our faith in you. Father, show us your glory. Father, I pray for people in this room. I pray for people on, on, on live right now through the, uh, through tech, uh, through the phone. Father, those that will watch this in the future, that they want to see change, that they want to be part of change, that they are tired of seeing a community that is hurting. I'm tired of seeing a community that has no purpose. Father, bring us together as one because where two or one are gathered, two or more are gathered, Father, you are there with us. Father, be here with us now and show us your glory. Father, Paul told us in his letter to the Corinthian church to live, to obey, and to love, and to believe. Father, strengthen us. Make that our sounding board. And let nothing minimize our purpose. Nothing minimize our calling. It doesn't matter if the enemy strikes at us and we have a virus. It doesn't matter if he shuts doors that another window will open. It doesn't matter what somebody thinks of us. It doesn't matter what another pastor thinks, Father, that we will love all people. This is the mission that you've given us. Father, we surrender to you. Whatever you will do with focus, whatever you will do with us individually, Father, show us your glory. Oh my God, you are amazing. And we honor you in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.